Good afternoon and good morning everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Athena Robinson and I am an attending faculty member in the Eating Disorder Clinic at Stanford University's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Thank you all for being a part of this webinar today. And this is brought to you as a member benefit of the Academy for Eating Disorders. We hope you will enjoy the benefit from this webinar, which is entitled Update on Family-Based Therapy for Eating Disorders. Before I um, introduce you to and turn you over to our presenter, I'd like to go over just two housekeeping details. First, there will be a 30-minute question and answer session at the end of this presentation. We invite you and encourage you to submit your questions as we go along through the presentation using the questions feature on your webinar control panel. Questions submitted through the webinar will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to include your name and location along with your question. Second, if you experience any technical difficulties while participating in the webinar, please use the questions feature to contact staff. AED Director of Communications, Etta Carter, will be standing by to help you out. Alrighty then, now I'd like to move forward and introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. James Locke. Dr. Locke is a professor of child psychiatry and pediatrics and associate chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine, where he also serves as director of the Eating Disorder Program for Children and Adolescents. Dr. Locke has published over 300 articles, abstracts, books, and book chapters. He is the past recipient of a National Institute of Health Career Development Award and a current recipient of a mid-career award. He is active in research with four currently NIH-funded projects related to eating disorder treatment in children and adolescents and young adults, as well as numerous national and international collaborations. His recent research focuses on integrating treatment research with neuroscience and eating disorders, including examining neurocognitive processes and their functional and neuroanatomical neuro correlates. He has lectured widely in the US, Canada, Europe, South America, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Dr. Locke's current research focuses on interventions for anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa in younger patients, which is funded by NIH in the US. He was awarded the Price Family Foundation Award for Research Excellence in 2010 and the Leadership Award from the International Academy of Eating Disorders in 2014. Currently, he is the Ellen Andrews Wright Fellow at the Humanity Center at Stanford. In his spare time, Dr. Locke enjoys running, reading, and writing fiction. We are thrilled to have you here today with us, Dr. Locke, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Welcome. Well, thank you, Athena. Uh, it's delightful to be here, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so uh, today, uh, these are my disclosures. I just want people to know that um, uh, I have received some funding from various sources, which is a great relief um, in order to continue to do science as well as clinical care. Um, and um, people buy some of the books we've written and, um, and have come to some of our training events. So today we're going to start with an overview of the family-based treatment model um, and discuss uh, then the fundamental assumptions in the first uh, three sessions. That'll take about half of our time and then we're going to be talking about the evidence base supporting FBT and then we'll have half an hour for questions at the end. So um, let's just get started then. So just to get started, I, I like to always remind us about a little bit about the history of anorexia nervosa. Uh, Sir William Gull, who's pictured here, uh, was Queen Victoria's physician and the first uh, uh, person to describe uh, anorexia nervosa in the um, medical tradition uh, in the UK and at that time England. And he wrote, uh, the patient should be fed at regular intervals and surrounded by persons who would have moral control over them relatives and friends being generally the worst attendants. So his view uh, was that refeeding was necessary um, and that it needed to be done by somebody besides family members. And in fact, family members were, uh, in his view, particularly bad at this idea. 
Um, Charcot, a French neurologist and psychiatrist uh, pictured here, um, it wrote, it is necessary to separate both children and adults from their father and mother, whose influence as experience teaches is particularly pernicious. So um, Charcot uh, has described not only the necessity uh, of uh, separating children and adults from their father and mother, in terms of their ability to get better from anorexia, but also uh, sees them as a pernicious influence, not just not good at it, but actually uh, a dark influence. Uh, I point out this history because it's had a long shadow across how we think about treatment for eating disorders over the last 130 years. These uh, uh, perspectives were generated in the Late, late half of the 19th century, and so um, a lot of a lot of views have changed since then. But the treatment for anorexia nervosa, in particular, um, has stuck pretty much to this model that parents aren't very good at repeating their children, and and a suspicion that they're actually uh, ideologically causative uh, of these disorders. In contrast to, to this idea, uh, family-based treatment, um, which was initially developed at the Mosley Hospital in London in the 1980s, inspired in part by the work of Salvin Armanuchin at the Philadelphia Guidance Center, um, uh, took a different approach. Um, the clinicians there uh, had a good uh, inpatient service at the time where they refed kids uh, effectively using a, a nursing staff. And, um, but they also uh, made an observation, a um, series of observations, that suggested maybe that families were not quite so bad as, as Charcot thought, and maybe they could be helpful um, in helping their children. They worried about hospitalization. Hospitalization at that time was a really lengthy affair, uh, not uncommon to have kids in the hospital for a year or more. Um, and so there was a, a downside uh, in terms of damaging developmental processes in kids, separating from their parents, disempowering them, and so forth. And then as a result of that, when ch children were discharged, there were transition issues um, from these hospital stays. Um, the, the two main authors of the uh, clinical approach were Yvonne Eisler and Christopher Dare, and they were both family therapists, and they were uh, we're really familiar with the various schools of family therapy, which were vying for um, uh, sort of a dominance uh, during the 80s um, and 70s. Um, and these four schools um, each make contributions to family-based treatment. Um, and one is uh, Mnuchin, which I mentioned already, who pay particular attention to structural changes in families as a result of having an ill child, um, particularly the loss of of uh, intergenerational boundaries um, and the disempowerment of parents. From uh, Salvini Palazzoli, the Milan School, or Systemic School of Therapy, uh, there was uh, uh, the notion that families themselves were uh, uh, a bit hermetic and that the way to approach them was to consult with them rather than try uh, and engage them um, directly to, uh, through suggestions. And, uh, and also from the systemic school was the use of circular questioning, which allows you to um, evoke um, an understanding of the illness in which everyone participates. From Jay Haley, um, uh, strategic family therapy school, there are paradoxical interventions. These are interventions which are designed to uh, limit the options a family can have as a result of uh, paradoxical injunctions. And the most important of these we'll talk about in a minute, in my view, has to do with the therapeutic bind that's established in session one. And finally, from white narrative therapy, there's the use of externalization. Um, this is a piece of work that has to do with trying to help families see anorexia as something that is affecting their child and family rather than as a fault of the child. Um, and uh, this externalization uh, allows parents and, and the adolescent themselves at times to see the problem independent of other processes. And this 
often facilitate uh, behavioral change. Um, at Stanford and at the University of Chicago, um, we manualized this approach um, in the late 90s and published in 2001 the first edition of this treatment manual. This is a picture of the second edition which came out last year. Um, you can read much more about this approach uh, in this volume. Um, Family-based treatment <clears throat> is an outpatient treatment, so it's not doesn't mean that some of the fundamental assumptions and approaches couldn't be used in other settings, <clears throat> but the idea is that families are uh, able to have the authority to act definitively about changing behaviors, and that can only really take place in their own homes um, and not in a setting where um, professionals are running uh, the show. It's primarily uh, initially designed to restore weight and to block the maintaining behaviors associated with anorexia and bulimia. And um, the secondary goal is, uh, over the course of treatment, to make sure the adolescent tracks back to their normal adolescent um, developmental uh, processes. It's a team approach, meaning um, the, the, everyone on the, on the team has to feel comfortable that the uh, patient is medically safe for outpatient care, uh, and that there's communication between the medical team evaluating uh, the malnutrition and cardiac and, and other systemic effects of malnutrition uh, and the therapists, uh, whether it's a psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker or nurse therapist. The treatment expects that in the case of anorexia specifically, there may be brief hospitalizations needed for um, medical problems that emerge, especially early in treatment. However, these um, uh, are not lengthy hospitalizations. These would be brief medical hospitalizations. FPT has three phases. Um, the first phase, uh, usually between one and ten sessions weekly, um, uh, is a facilitated uh, uh, therapy where parents are learned to sort of take on, take the bull by the horns in terms of being able to do what a nursing staff would have done on an inpatient refeeding service, in terms of blocking the maintaining behaviors of anorexia, making sure the child eats enough and doesn't, um, and disrupts any kind of comp compensatory behaviors like over-exercise or purging. This usually lasts about two months. Um, phase two, uh, which, in which sessions are held every other week, um, is a uh, an opportunity for the adolescent uh, to move uh, back to age-appropriate management of eating and weight and, and exercise uh, as they can tolerate and manage that without decompensation. Uh, so sessions are every other week and the uh, learning curve uh, for the family is uh, uh, based on how much the adolescent is able to manage uh, as she or he uh, gains weight. Usually phase two begins somewhere when the, when the adolescent is about at 90% or so of expected um, weight. Um, more important though is that they're eating without difficulty under parental supervision. So that if that's going well and weight's being gained appropriately, then you begin to be able to ask the question about well, when can she or he begin to take over for themselves. It's a gradual transition. I use the analogy of of uh, someone who has been in a, uh, a teenager who's been in a, uh, got a speeding ticket, you might not initially get the car uh, back to the kid and say, okay, just drive. Uh, you might actually say, nope, for a while you're not going to be driving. We'll be making sure that you uh, are safely getting where you need to go. And then as we are more comfortable with that, we may transition you to being able to drive to and from school but with no friends and so on back to where they reach their full privileges. And this is much of what you're doing in phase two around eating weight and exercise. Finally, um, a brief phase at the end, and that phase can last two to four months. Um, uh, uh, and then phase three is when um, we really have resolved the main behavioral issues associated with uh, eating, with the adolescents eating on our own well. She may have a little more weight to gain, but overall things are going pretty smoothly. And in phase three, um, you're meeting monthly, um, and this can uh, be a, a session, a set of sessions that um, we 
two to four sessions. Um, and these are really an opportunity for the family to think about life without anorexia. The, what the, the parents, if there are two, how they can move past their worry and concern and have a relationship with each other that's not based on um, just taking care of their, their son or daughter with anorexia. That the adolescent can begin to work on other kinds of issues related to adolescence, um, things like dating and, and planning for school or, or things of that type. Um, it's a brief phase. It's not meant to be um, adolescent therapy uh, in general. It's meant just to transition um, back to uh, life without anorexia in the family. The fundamental assumptions that underlie uh, family-based treatment um, are these five. Um, the first is an agnostic view of the cause of anorexia. And I just want to reiterate this point just a little bit. Um, okay. We don't know the cause of anorexia. And um, so being agnostic is, a, is actually an accurate um, perspective to take um, on um, uh, the etiology of anorexia and bulimia for that matter. What I would say is though that many treatments presume um, in their approach uh, that there is uh, an etiology um, uh, and that is not the approach of this treatment. It's really one where you're not blaming parents uh, or, or the adolescent him or herself for having caused the illness. Instead, uh, you're really trying to get them to see that there is a problem that they need to solve. So not blaming doesn't mean there's no responsibility. There is actually a huge emphasis on those, the absolute critical need to intervene, um, but not based on um, addressing etiology, but rather the behaviors and, and uh, particularly not eating and over-exercise or binging and purging associated with the eating disorder. The second is um, the therapist uh, is a consultant to the family. I spoke a little bit about this when talking about contributions of systemic family therapy. You, the, the opportunity here is to use your expertise as a person who knows about eating disorders to help the family learn. All therapy is learning uh, and uh, these families come in with a fair bit of knowledge of their, about their own family, um, but they usually have not had much experience with an eating disorder. And as a result of that, um, your consultation is going to be primarily around helping them to learn how their family, which they know more about, can help their child address help by addressing the maintaining behaviors and helping them understand what anorexia and bulimia are, how these, what, what, how these kids think, uh, why the behaviors are hard to change, uh, what kinds of uh, likely uh, tricks that might be pulled on them, things like this, as well as strategies for helping them figure out how they're going to actually block behaviors, um, think them through with them. There's very little decision making by the therapist. In other words, this is a the families get a lot of information, um, a lot of consultations, very active as therapy, but the decision making is going to be left in the parents' hands. Um, the third one is parents are responsible for weight restoration or blocking other maintaining behaviors like binging and purging if you're talking about the one. Parents are responsible meaning that they're going to be uh, that's going to be their main job, and you want to empower them to do that. You empower people by giving them information through consultation, by soliciting their input, um, learning what the dilemmas are from them. So there's a lot of questions that are asked in therapy. How did you do this? What do you think worked? Um, what didn't work? Um, what would you like to do differently? These are ways that you in help people know that they're one, expected, and two, empowered to actually make changes. In other words, you're trying to make sure that the locus of change is in the family and mostly at home. But this is not a therapy you're directing. I mentioned externalization um, from the work of White um, uh, and narrative therapy. The purpose of, of externalization, which is a critical early intervention that goes on throughout all therapy, is to help the family feel comfortable 
attacking the behaviors and not their child uh, when they're working on these um, stubborn uh, challenges of self-starvation, binge and purging. And also, on the other hand, for the therapist to convey to the patient, him or herself, that the therapist also doesn't see the child as having being a bad person or uh, having chosen this illness or believes that they are somehow uh, making uh, a free will choice to do these things. This will be despite the protests early on in treatment that sometimes kids make. Uh, you know, I, I did choose this, this is what I want to do. The therapist in insisting on using externalization really gives, gives a strong message which will ultimately be heard um, that they believe that there are more than these eating disorders and that there's another part of them that um, has been, uh, is conserved, the, the healthy part of them, and that um, you're going to get back to it. It's a very practical therapy. Um, in other words, the therapy doesn't go into a lot of history about other family issues or bigger picture issues. It focuses really on symptom management. And this focus has a, an impact on changing specific behaviors, not global behaviors. And we'll come back to that as we discuss um, uh, outcome research um, a bit later. Often uh, people ask, you know, what, what kind of expertise do you need to have um, to practice family-based treatment? And it's a great question. Um, and first, you need to have mental health training. So you need to be a therapist. This can be a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, or a nurse therapist. You need to be a therapist uh, and eligible for licensure or licensed because there's a lot of things going on in, in these families. You need to be trained to see them, anticipate them, work with problems that are likely to emerge at times that are serious, like suicidal thoughts or, or threats or um, abuse or neglect or things, all kinds of different things that can come up in addition to having the skills needed to observe and understand the processes a family is going through. That goes right into the second point, which is that you need a lot of experience working with adolescents and families. So you need to understand what adolescent process is, you need to understand the kind of developmental parts of adolescence from puberty to mid-adolescence to young adulthood. We need to understand how families themselves change and grow during that process. Because these things uh, have a huge impact on how families view what they're doing and how they feel. Because uh, right at the beginning of treatment, for example, when suddenly you're going back to feeding your child like you might have done when they were three or four, um, feels very alien to adolescents process and family development at that point. And so being able to speak to that and understand that and how divergent is from what would be expected helps a family also understand why they're doing it now and why it's necessary, but also understand that that's not where you want things to end up. And finally, and most importantly, probably, you need to have any sort of expertise. You really do need to understand how, how kids uh, un think about their illness, how they what their worries are about their bodies, how, how their thoughts change and their behaviors change as a result of this, the kinds of strategies that um, are common uh, in terms of maintaining these behaviors that kids have developed, um, anticipate um, their use of media and of uh, other kinds of negative support systems uh, to maintain their behaviors. All these things you need to know as a person who, who has expertise in eating disorders. Common dilemmas that are seen um, in, in these uh, cases are divorced parents. So when parents are no longer together, um, those situations, the family does define who comes to therapy. Um, the FBT is pretty clear about everyone that lives in the same household being there. But if a parent uh, lives in a different household for whatever reason, the decision about their involvement is going to be something that the two parents make together. Sometimes both parents come for all the sessions, even if they don't live in the same place. Um, and sometimes non-biological relatives who live in the same household might be there. Sometimes grandparents might be there. The, the dilemma that often 
comes up as a result of disease, how do you do refeeding and uh, weight restoration in one or more than one home or one or more setting? Um, families have to decide whether they want to try and address it in two settings, and the child going back and forth, or whether for a time they would like to locate all the uh, meals at one house or the other. Um, and it, uh, different families solve this differently, but I give an analogy often that if you have a 16-year-old who's in a motorcycle accident and he needs to be in traction and has to have help getting to and from the bathroom, he needs to have a hospital bed at home, you usually don't move him back and forth between houses because it's going to be really hard on him and it's going to make the whole process more complicated. And in many ways that's true for trying to set up a uh, refeeding program at home. Um, if you're transit, if you're going back and forth from one house to another, they're just different opportunities for confusion. Um, the other thing that comes up often is family psychopathology. Um, you know, there's particular worry. This goes right back to to Charcot's observations uh, about pernicious influences, and um, the data on this isn't good in terms of uh, knowing ahead of time that any particular family uh, may or may not do well. Um, we, we often make the observation in our treatment group here at Stanford and, and also at the University of Chicago, uh, we are really not good at predicting who's going to do well. Um, people surprise us. Um, however, active parental discord, if people are in the process of divorce, it's very difficult to do a family-based treatment. If someone is divorced and its main issues are resolved, it's quite possible. Um, if a parent is really unable to take care of themselves, um, meaning they are psychotic or uh, so uh, substance dependent that they are unable to take care of themselves, or they have some serious medical problem that's interfering with their ability to take care of themselves, it's unlikely they're going to also be able to take care of their child. So it would be really worth evaluating whether that person would be the right, uh, what that kind of family would be worth, worth uh, doing this with. And finally, parents with an eating disorder. So the data on this is really mixed. We don't really have any data that suggests any straightforward answer. What we have seen is families, some families where one of the parents has an eating disorder do very well because the parent understands the dilemmas, can predict the behavior, and understands the thinking, and is very, very helpful. On the other hand, we've seen the opposite here their parents' own preoccupations and dilemmas interfere with their ability to make the right choices and um, work with uh, their son or daughter with immune disorder. So it, I would say it's not an automatic out at all. In fact, I would say I would talk, I bring it up as part of what we need to evaluate in doing this. Finally, if someone tells you they don't want to do FBT, they will not do it, then it's really not something that you should try and do. A lot of times um, there are, just to bring up two other issues, um, in single parent households there's a, a dilemma that often the therapist faces around um, how to um, empower a single parent to do all this work. And sometimes the, the parent will try and um, use the therapist as a partner in this process and that's something that should be avoided um, and that instead should, these families should, these single parent families should be encouraged to find another adult ally to help because it is a lot of work. Um, in, in our studies we know that treatment of single parent families um, and divorced families tends to take a little longer. Um, in single child families, um, in contrast, the child is the one that's alone. There are all these adults in the room, a therapist and two parents and so on. And in this case, the therapist really does need to be more active in making sure that the patient gets support from him or her as a therapist since there's no sibling in the room um, and would encourage the role of friends. Um, the approach in FBT basically uh, is that most of the symptoms of comorbidity in these patients, usually anxiety or depression, are things that um, ameliorate with treatment of starvation and the blocking of the maintaining behaviors of anorexia or bulimia, but particularly anorexia here. And in this case, um, we would usually delay the use of medication, um, and we would say that the only thing that really trumps uh, for anorexia 
uh, is self-starvation. In the case of bulimia, in contrast, there, are, there can one of the really challenges in the FBT with bulimic patients is that you have to keep your eye on mini balls because these patients may have a lot of other kinds of dilemmas that are very important uh, problems for them, whether it's substance use, truancy, um, difficulty with boyfriends or, or running away, things like this. There's instability in a percentage of these bulimic patients that is quite different than most of the anorexics. And so the approach to bulimics is going to be to try and do more integration within the session of problem solving other than just around the eating. So just an overview of phase one, I talked a little about this. The focus is helping parents take control of weight restoration processes and most of your engagement in session and your time is going to be talking to the parents. Um, but you will also attempt to engage the adolescent here who may not be particularly engageable at this stage and any siblings for their support of their brother or sister. As I said, these are usually eight to ten sessions, usually weekly, um, and you want to disrupt these severe dieting and relating dysfunction, related dysfunctional behaviors. So session one, I just want to, session one is, um, I often call this the funeral session. The purpose of this is to engage the family and obtain a history of how anorexia has been affecting the family, how it's changed the relationships between the mother and the father and the siblings and, the, and, and, and with the patient herself or himself, and look what the results of that are in terms of how the family is uh, managing things and to reduce parental blame. Um, the interventions uh, are basically to make sure you engage all the family members at the beginning. Um, we use circular questioning, which I mentioned earlier, which is designed to reinforce through um, revisiting the same question across family members um, a unified vision about what's happening in the family as a result of anorexia nervosa. It's not meant to be a, a family history um, at all uh, of everything else, just around anorexia. Externalization, uh, which, uh, which we use as a strategy, as I mentioned, to keep the family targeting anorexia rather than their child uh, or bulimia. Then we want to illustrate just how bad things can get, and this is where the funeral part gets in, uh, of the medical and psychological, emotional, and developmental impacts of anorexia and bulimia over time, um, and how intervention now is the most likely uh, effective strategy, and that they can be effective agents, and that's charging parents with this task, um, making sure they understand what they can do and what they need to do. When we're engaging families, just a few other points about this for a session. Families are often too anxious or not anxious enough. Um, so whenever I do any kind of therapy, I'm really trying to gauge with the readiness for learning in the therapy. So if someone has no interest or is unmotivated, um, doesn't have any sense of worry about a problem, it's very difficult to get them to, to use and engage in therapy. On the other hand, if they're way over the top, so worried, so anxious, they can't think clearly, then I want to be able to provide them with um, a, a container for that anxiety in, in the relationship that, that I have with the patient and the family. So I think about this as this, this uh, strategic intervention of a therapeutic bond. On the one hand, I'm telling the family, you've got a desperate situation here, your child could die, and yet I'm very warm about it and caring and giving them hope. So there's this paradoxical quality uh, uh, bond. When we look at family functioning, just, just to make this point clear, we're not really trying to find psychopathology in the family. In fact, we're just looking for problems that are going to interfere with the family changing behaviors. So it's a little shift in perspective. Rather than looking at psychopathology, we're looking at things that will be interfering factors. Um, it matters because that way of thinking, um, uh, uh, non-blaming way, non-finger-pointing way actually helps better, uh, helps to ensure that the family gets the message that you actually don't blame them or see them as the problem. Common problems that we see the parents don't agree on what to do. Parents, one parent is over-identified with the patient and, and 
anxious about it. The other one might be disengaged and, and feels left out. Um, parents may be actively in conflictual relationship with each other about this. And conflicts uh, between the siblings, envy or anger, uh, frustration with the behaviors. Many of these things happen at a low level in a lot of families, but when anorexia comes in, this highlights these things and brings out and exacerbates uh, these, and the consequences are that families become stuck. And of course, reducing parental gl blame really is fundamentally got to do with a lot of messages is that parents receive um, both directly and indirectly about having caused this problem, and um, that guilt um, for having potentially caused this problem interferes with their ability to actually feel confident about and uh, that they're going to be able to be effective in making change. And this is very important in terms of being able to um, help the family feel very clearly that you don't blame them and that you don't see that as um, something that um, you see that as something that's going to bother them as opposed to to help them. So we want to really dispel that. Session two is the family meal. Um, this is a, a, a version of what Mnuchin did originally in his work, family work. But it's quite different. Um, there's the, the purpose of it is to look at the family structure um, uh, as it, at mealtime, how all those coalitions and, and, and um, effects of, uh, make the, the mealtime either difficult or impossible to make sure that eating takes place. It's an opportunity to coach the parents directly around eating and um, helping their child eat more. Uh, that's to eat one more bite than planned. These are the main interventions. We weigh the patient at every session, and uh, we weigh them because we want feedback uh, for the family on how they're doing. So if the child's gaining weight, we would want to congratulate them on that and hear all the good things that they, were, they had done successfully. Child hasn't gained weight or has lost weight, will be worried with the family, will still be looking for the things they tried and try and build on the efforts they've made. But it sets the tone for the session. In the mealtime session, we are really focused on trying to understand who makes the meals, who's available at mealtime, what kinds of foods are currently being served, what, what kind of meal the family brought, uh, do they bring a meal that the adolescent would normally eat, do they bring a meal as directed that they think she should eat or he should eat, do they bring a meal that they um, thought about at all, do the parents actually uh, think about it together as they instructed. So there's a there's a lot of learning that takes place in, in this interview around meal times. After the child has said she's not going to eat anymore, we ask the parents to help uh, the child eat one more bite. Um, and there's direct coaching about how the parents get aligned, agreeing on what needs to be eaten, agreeing on how to ensure that it happens, and um, making sure the child cannot leave the table until there is, there is sufficient eating. So it's an it's a it's a it's a actually uh, not a conflict ridden session, but it, it can be an emotional session. After um, that, we look directly at um, the sessions three through the rest of phase one. Every single session is focused on what, what happened this week, what did you change, what kind of plans are you making, what worked, what didn't work, um, what was what's happening um, with the response to eating, in terms of emotion and, and fighting back and so on. Most of these sessions are really focused on helping the parents master the skill of doing really good, um, safe repeating of their child. So there's directing, redirecting, and focusing this discussion on eating and weight. So it's really remember that fifth fundamental principle of initial uh, symptom focus. I mean, first, particularly strongly in the first phase, <clears throat> you just maybe temp attempts at times to talk about other issues, um, other dilemmas, um, which are actually distracting from the focus on actually changing the skill base of the parents. You really want to have the parents learn to talk more. They're critical of the child, which we know can be interfering with their overall progress. You want to help them understand how criticism affects their, their child and how then they'll make it harder for them. And we use that 
a lot of that we use through externalizations. And we want to, to make sure the siblings um, are finding a way to express their care and their um, affection for their, their sister or brother with anorexia or anemia by always involving them in coming up with specific tasks or opportunities that they can do on a weekly basis to be supportive of their brother or sister outside of the meeting. Okay, so that's just a brief overview uh, of, the, of the main uh, perspectives on um, FBT in terms of how you do it and again, more detail um, can be found in that treatment manual and other descriptions. But why should you learn about FBT in more detail anyway? Well, now I want to try and convince you that the data is there that you should consider it if you treat children and adolescents with eating disorders. Um, this slide summarizes the um, existing randomized clinical trials for um, uh, FBT uh, for uh, anorexia and bulimia in adolescents. Um, there's, a, <clears throat> there's about um, a thousand um, people studied in these randomized clinical trials now, um, which is uh, sounds like a lot. Most of these studies are, uh, well, it sounds like a lot to some people. It's actually not a very big number, um, but it is, uh, it is better than it used to be. You can see that uh, we've had a lot of studies um, from about 1999 to 2015, um, which um, have given us information about um, how to treat anorexia and bulimia in, in kids. Um, there's only um, uh, one other uh, adolescent-focused um, outpatient study um, that, that looked at CBT um, for anorexia nervosa. Um, almost all the studies published have looked at FBT. So we're missing a lot of information about other treatments, I should say. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about these. So first, individual therapy. So the first kind of um, individual therapy compared to family treatment was um, supportive nonspecific therapy. This is a study published a long time ago now, in 1987, in which patients were admitted to the hospital in uh, London at weights of about 65% uh, um, ideal body weight. Um, and you can see on the uh, vertical axis that uh, that's the starting point for all of them. Their weight was stored in hospital to 90%, um, and that took about um, uh, five to six weeks. Um, and then they were randomized to receive either family treatment, which is the dark line, or individual therapy, which is the red line. And um, you can see here that the uh, family-based treatment um, arm did better throughout the course of treatment. It wasn't until five years later that the individual therapy group reached the weight threshold that the family treatment group had at one year. And these are adolescents or average of age 14. So these kids were being kept at relatively low weights for um, an extended period of time, um, complicating both their psychological, emotional, and physical development. Now, um, the second kind of, of uh, studies about comparison to individual and family treatment were looking at more specific treatment. Um, and the, the main authors of these um, concepts underlying individual therapy, which has a psychological and um, developmental basis, are Hilda Brook and, and Arthur Crisp. Hilda Brook wrote, Excess, excessive concern with the body and its size and the rigid control of the eating are late symptoms in the development of youngsters who have been engaged in a desperate fight against feeling enslaved and exploited, not confident to lead a life of their own. The, the target then is not eating symptoms. It's actually on this feeling of being enslaved and incompetent. And that um, psychological treatment, certainly as I learned, had to do fundamentally with trying to increase in uh, a feeling of competence and that the eating disorder itself was an area of control where they could feel competent uh, and, and, and effective, uh, one of the few areas. So trying then to work on that in a different arena than eating and weight um, was the main target of the treatment. Similarly, author Crisp, um, who looked at adolescent process, wrote, the avoidant position in anorexia nervosa is therefore a profoundly psychosomatic one. 
rooted in a seemingly miraculously, miraculous and certainly unique capacity to reverse pubertal process, and hence all of its social and psychological impacts. So what he's saying here is that um, uh, anorexia nervosa specifically blocks adolescent process, and it's a, an avoidant strategy and very effective. And so therapy, which is targeting um, uh, these adolescent processes, reigniting those, um, mastery, independence, autonomy from families. So this is the other aspects, so autonomy, competence, and self-efficacy are the targets uh, as opposed to eating behaviors in um, these psychologically oriented individual therapies. So how well do these work? So the first study to compare family treatment to individual therapy was done by Arthur Robin um, uh, and, uh, at Wayne State, and this is a basic um, graph of the two main findings, one um, on weight, BMI, and the other on eating attitudes. Um, and the hypothesis that they had was that family treatment, because of its focus on weight gain, would be more effective um, on changing weight trajectory, uh, whereas uh, individual therapy, um, this, uh, which they called ego-oriented individual therapy, um, EOIT, as you can see on the little box on the graph there, that is uh, a therapy that would be changing attitudes and beliefs, right, and competencies. So they believe that um, individual therapy would be more effective than that. What they actually found was that there were uh, advantages uh, weight-wise, as they predicted, for the group that got um, family treatment. Family treatment was more effective. But there were no differences uh, in the outcome for the individual um, uh, psychological aspects of care. So what they concluded was um, both treatments were reasonably good, but that the overall advantage went to family therapy because it did better for weight and as well on psychological variables. This is a small study, only 37 people were in it. Daniel Lagrange and I looked at um, this um, same uh, treatment in a larger study of 121 adolescents with anorexia nervosa in two sites. Um, that's at um, Stanford and then at Chicago. And this is just one of the ways to look at the outcome. We called the individual therapy adolescent focused therapy. It was more or less the same as EOIT, um, but we didn't really like that name. And FBT and the bars. Um, on uh, AFT show uh, remission rates um, to the dark, darkest parts of the bars um, of about 20% um, across the board and for FBT about 40 to 45% um, across the board. Remission was defined as full weight restoration, meaning 95% of expected and a normal EBE, meaning one standard deviation from age, um, expected norms. So it was a high bar, um, and you can see here that overall FBT was twice as effective um, as um, individual therapy in achieving that. When you look at the middle bars, the slightly gray bars, you see there's much more variability um, and uh, no differences on partial remission. But partial remission was also very unstable, meaning that this was someone who gained weight just to 85% uh, or more. Uh, this tended to be a very unstable group in terms of maintenance. And the white, there are people who didn't respond to either treatment. Dropouts were low for both treatments, so both treatments appeared feasible and acceptable. Weight gain was much faster in FPT, as you might expect, because um, it's focused on weight gain. Um, and hospitalization was significantly uh, less in FPT because of, uh, likely because of that weight gain early on. And so remember, these were medical hospitalizations. We, um, we wanted to know if there were subgroups of patients who did better in one treatment or the other. Um, we were hoping to identify a subgroup that would do well in individual work. Um, we actually did not find that, but what we did find was uh, something helpful, I think. And our moderators are baseline characteristics of patients that um, might predict outcomes. So if something called the Yale-Brown-Cornell mean disorder um, uh, uh, interview is um, looks at obsessive compulsive features around eating. Now all anorexics and uh, have these, um, but those that were in the highest group, um, which is on the right, um, versus below uh, on the left, 
you're in the highest group, you did much better in family treatment. Um, and if you're in the low group, you did better in family treatment, but the differences were not as great. Similarly, if you had high EDE score, even for exam score, um, you did much better in family treatment. If you had a lower score, you did about the same in both treatments. If you were a binge purge subtype um, purger, you did better in family treatment and not and not much difference if you are non purger So what this sort of says is something a little maybe contrary to what I might have initially predicted, the sicker the kids are, the, these are, you know, the presence of high obsessive compulsive features, purging, and of high EDE scores would indicate greater levels of psychopathology. They're the ones that need their parents most to help them. They're really less able to use individual therapy. And that's just something really uh, important to think about um, moving forward. So one of the things that we were also wondering about is, is our treatment effects in FBT nonspecific are dependent on therapeutic alliance. And we, we, we looked at several of these things. And the, the nutshell uh, of this is therapeutic alliance, um, uh, looking across uh, the two main studies we've done, um, are pretty good in FBT. Um, if you look um, at the very bottom point there, our therapeutic alliance was better in individual therapy, AFT, than FPT, but it didn't affect outcomes. In other words, as good as it, even though it was better, about a point better, if those patients that had higher alliance didn't do better. And this is consistent with um, uh, the other findings about therapeutic alliance that we have, of, which was that, there's a fourth point there, that therapeutic alliance is dependent on weight gain um, by the end of treatment. So if you don't get weight gain, the therapeutic alliance is going to go down. Um, we, last year we published a study um, uh, also looking at systemic therapy, manualized version from the needs group um, versus manualized FBT, 164 adolescents were randomized to six sites. Um, there were no differences on weight at any point, but weight gain was much quicker uh, in uh, family-based treatment. We used um, with many fewer hospital days at much lower costs. Interestingly, looking at um, CYBOP, which is the um, not eating related obsessive compulsive features, but general obsessive compulsive features, the more general approach in systemic work was more effective. So just a couple of process things. Um, importantly, FPT, you can get a really early marker for a response to, to FPT. By week four, um, you can pretty much know uh, in three quarters to uh, cases about who's going to do well. Um, you can predict very well. And this, this study here, initially published by Doyle et al., uh, has been replicated um, in two other studies, one here and one also not cited um, in, by uh, the Westmead Group in Australia. Um, recently, we published a report trying to address these the people who didn't respond uh, to FBT uh, by week four by using an adaptive intensive parental coaching strategy. This parental coaching involves um, meeting with the parents separately, uh, then having a um, another family meal. Um, so, in, in which specific no longer an assessment session, but specific coaching around their current dilemmas that are identified in the, in the meeting with the parents. And the preliminary data on this suggests um, a couple of things. This is that data. Um, basically, it's acceptable. Dropout number of sessions and suitability ratings were all good for um, uh, adding in intensive parental coaching. Um, and also, the overall um, weight trajectory change was this, uh, improved. In other words, uh, if you look at this graph, um, this shows you how many patients who got uh, anticipatory parental coaching who didn't gain weight, that's the red line. Once they got it, they did better than when they reached normal weight, as opposed to the dotted line, which is a group of patients from a different study who didn't gain, uh, didn't get IPC, 
but had also had not gained five pounds. So it tells you that preliminarily this new intervention can change the trajectory and get them back on track for recovery. We also looked at mechanisms of FPT and we found that changes in parental self-efficacy um, were uh, clear by session two. People who were going to respond, those parents felt more self-efficacious about refeeding using the parent versus anorexia nervosa scale um, compared to those who ended up not gaining. But when you add IPC to it, you can see that by the session eight, which is about when the IPC ends, there are no longer differences in the self-efficacy scores of the two groups. So that's it's promising about understanding what you're targeting um, in, in the FPT in terms of mechanism and also particularly in trying to change it. We also looked at dose and this is a study which compared six months versus 10 and 10 sessions over 12 months and 20 sessions and this is uh, just weight change in kilograms um, over time and basically those lines are identical so that on average parents uh, uh, can be effective uh, as effective uh, in six months over with 10 sessions as 20 over a year. And just in follow-up to that, we wondered if that would be maintained over time. And this just gives you BMI and EDE scores. And these two lines, the pink line is for longer term, the 12-month treatment versus the blue line, which is a short-term treatment. Those were um, treatments that um, there were no differences over time. So this was maintained. So this isn't to say that every patient um, can get better in 10 sessions in six months, but you should expect that many patients will. For bulimia nervosa, um, we have many, many fewer studies. This is a slide which shows you the three, four case series which were done. Um, the, the case series data from Locke and Chapman um, are um, CBT related and the others are FPT. And then the two previous studies which were RCTs, um, I'm going to discuss this here, and this basically shows you the results of those two RCTs. The one on the left is from Lagrange, and basically those are remission rates, 40% at end of treatment um, for FPT versus 20% for individual therapy, and then a follow-up 30 versus 10. In the Schmidt et al. study, um, you see uh, uh, the, both groups have it's a different pattern. Um, the, uh, but there are no differences in outcome between the two in, in, in her study. So there was a controversy about which of these, you know, what to make of this. Um, one was individual therapy and the other was, uh, that was in Lagrange et al. And the other study was comparing um, to a self-help version of CBT. So there were different comparisons. So Daniel uh, Lagrange and I just recently published a two-site study of 130 adolescents with bulimia um, meeting DSM-IV criteria. Um, and there were 18 outpatient sessions provided over six months of CBT or FBT. And basically, the, the, you can look at the um, red line is for FBT and other abstinence rates versus CBT, which is the blue line. And there are statistically uh, favorable uh, findings for FPT for the, in the treatment of six months, but at follow-up there are no differences. That's probably uh, due, at least in part, to loss of power and attrition um, as one moves a year out after treatment. But you can see this adds to the case that FPT can be effective not only for adolescents with anorexia, but also for living. Briefly, um, hospital use. This is a study uh, I mentioned already, the decrease of hospitalization days um, in uh, individual versus uh, family treatment. A study done at Westmead compared short versus long hospitalization. Long hospitalization meant full weight restoration in hospital versus medical stability. And they looked at outcomes that um, end of treatment or on your follow-up. The only differences were the days, 15 for the short term, which is 37. The long term, there was the only differences in outcome um, found on any of the follow-up measures. In other words, there were no benefits to having additional hospitalization if treatment was followed by FPT. Just briefly, um, dissemination efforts. 
Um, FBT was implemented in 2004 in Westmead. They reported a 50% decrease in readmissions over that period. In Melbourne, 2009, FBT was implemented and they had a 56% decrease in admissions, 75% decrease in readmissions, and a 51% decrease in overall hospital day use. Um, and so those are huge impacts on systems of care. Just so, as a last point here, data supporting the use of FBT for anorexia under 12 has been published. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to do randomized trials for very young patients. There are just not a lot of them. Um, and so, uh, but FBT is certainly feasible and the outcomes look similar. Um, after adaptations for atypical eating disorders, particularly ARFID, uh, Fitzpatrick et al. has published uh, in a uh, volume new applications for FBT just published, um, and at adaptations for FPT for transition age youth, Demetropolis has published also um, an article describing those, and there are studies underway looking at um, FPT for these other populations. So with that, um, I think I've reached my time point for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim, for that presentation. It was great to hear about um, FBT and the process of administering the therapy and also the recent data on um, how research is progressing on the therapy as well. Uh, we do indeed have some questions here that some of our listeners submitted. Um, so I'll walk uh, you through these. So first, a question about the contraindications um, for FBT. I know during the presentation you mentioned a couple of considerations. For example, if a parent is um, has very problematic and um, ongoing substance abuse or for in some other way is unable to care for themselves, that that may be a consideration. Um, but there were many circumstances in which FBT would still be viable. For example, if a parent with parental discord or even if a parent had an eating disorder. Could you speak for a moment to this question about contraindications for FBT? So the, the only, so there's no data that, that I can say, oh, we know that these people, this, if someone is like this, they, kids won't do well, they won't do well. Um, and we just don't have data like that. Um, what I can say is, we would not do FBT if there was active abuse in the family of, of the child. Okay. That's even the contraindication that we would, would, would re and, and we might then work with the family for a little while around that, or for some while until we felt that was resolved, and then see if we could use it even then. And, and so there are no absolute contraindications. Again, one of the points I made was, though, if a family tells you we don't believe in FBT. We don't want to do it. You can't. You wouldn't expect any success for trying to force them to do it. Now, if someone's ambivalent or confused or open to the idea but not sure, that's different. That would be that would be a good um, uh, family to try and work with. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question we had come in is, uh, what are the current recommendations for incorporating FBT into an IOP or PHP treatment setting? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't. There's not an official set of recommendations um, um, that are published or uh, clearly articulated by anybody. Um, what I would say is, um, if you you can certainly prepare people well for FBT in inpatient or um, IOP kinds of programs by following the fundamental uh, principles as much as possible. Being non-blaming, um, being very clear about the externalization of the illness, helping the family learn while they're there, um, giving them opportunities to learn, um, observing um, the processes around nutrition uh, that are going on in those settings, um, giving them opportunities to actually practice in those settings, some of the repeating efforts. Those are the kinds of things that we typically do. Certainly on our, our, our medical inpatient service, that's what we do. We um, immediately, uh, for those families who are pretty clearly in the do FPT, we give them orientation materials around the treatment. We um, help them identify what they need to learn while they're there. 
and uh, facilitate that as much as possible. Okay, great. It really sounds like inviting them to be part of the process from the get-go, even though the child is not at home. Um, sounds like it's important for those yeah. IOP and PHP settings. Okay, another question that came in. Is there any research looking at the efficacy of parent support groups or multifamily meals to augment SBT? So, no. Um, none published. There, uh, there. So, family parent support groups. I don't know of any um, uh, particular uh, systematic studies. There have been some studies out of Australia that looked at parent um, consultation groups uh, who support. These are parents that voluntarily support a new family that comes in and helps them sort of think it through, and that that with preliminary data that suggests that could be helpful. Um, it makes a lot of intuitive sense, but no one studied it beyond a description of it. Okay. And multifamily groups, so there's, I know there was a study that's been conducted out of the UK um, by Yvonne Eisler, and there's been reports, um, oral reports on that um, study, but nothing published. Um, overall, I I think what the data suggests is that there were no particularly specific benefits to it over standard care, uh, standard FPT. Um, so then you, you're left with the question, well, who needs that and who would benefit from it? Because it's an it, it, it's a organizationally challenging treatment to offer um, mm. for some places because you need space and you need therapists blocking out several days and families blocking out several days. There are some data for a model like that done at UC San Diego um, where they do a kind of a boot camp. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they mostly are uh, trying to improve access to families who can't come week into weekly therapy so people coming from farther away. So they, they, and preliminary data about that suggests that it's feasible and acceptable. Uh, there's been no um, comparative data that I'm aware of yet comparing um, that approach to any other. But again, it's addressing an important issue about access uh, uh, to people who can't get easily into a clinic because they live too far away. Sure, the access is a good point. And also, I think um, one thing I'm reading into, I might be reading into this question, but the idea of just offering that additional mechanism for support for parents who might want to hear from other parents um, who are struggling with the same thing or, you know, tips and tidbits about how other families had success that may not be covered just in the same way in the original kind of FBT format. Absolutely. I think that, again, we just don't have data on it, but I, I, yeah. I think this is useful. Um, and certainly we have a parent support group here. Um, some parents avail themselves of it, some don't, and that's why we don't really know its impact on outcomes. Some parents feel much more comfortable in those settings than others. And, so it's a, it's a variable, uh, but as a general rule, I think these kind of support um, activities, whether they're in vivo or online or through some of the um, parental advocacy groups, are great things to have in any program. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Um, this inquiry asks if you have any thoughts on the role that registered dietitians specializing in eating disorders could play in family-based therapy. So, yeah, it's a common question. Um, so the studies have all um, been treatment studies that have not employed um, dietary advice as part of the intervention by a dietitian. Um, and so whether or not advice or non-advice um, uh, it would be helpful or not helpful is not really known. Um, what I can say is that dietary plans, the kind of where people are given a plan, um, kids are given a plan and parents are asked to follow it, that I can say is uh, pretty contrary to the model. The model is for parents to develop their own plans and to use their own skill base and understanding and grow it uh, rather than having it um, sort of given to them um, by, by an expert, whether it's a dietitian or somebody else. And so um, 
that part's different. In our own program, we are dietitian, and we have um, uh, dietitians in our program. Um, they do all the evaluations. They set the target weight targets. They um, uh, problem solve with the therapists um, around if there are dilemmas that they're looking at in terms of kids not getting weight. It sounds like they should be getting what they're being told. Um, so fundamentally, uh, they, they are consultants to the therapists and to the medical team around uh, the, the management of malnutrition and its effects. Um, they, there's not, um, there are no meetings with the adolescent herself or himself with the dietitian, just as there are no individual therapy times uh, with other kinds of therapists either um, in an FBT as we do it. Okay. Thank you. And um, we have a question about the adaptive treatment study. If you could provide the reference or guidance for further information, how someone could acquire further information on that study. Yes. Yeah. So the so that the it's published in Behavioral Research and Therapy, BRAP, uh, Behavioral Research and Therapy, and it was published in August of this year. Okay. Great. Um, and a question that I had about uh, that study was, maybe it's just a comment, but how practically useful those findings indeed are. We don't often have current therapies for which we know moderators or mechanisms of change. So this notion that FBT did better with those patients that ha had high YBC scores um, seems very practically useful in the clinical community. In addition, the finding that you had that the additional meal session and parent coaching was helpful for those who weren't progressing as ideal. Um, both of those findings seem really practically useful to the, the treating clinician who may be listening today. I think so. I think so. Um, one of the things I would say about those moderators, you know, the, the um, obsessive compulsive features around you um, and um, the EDE scores and the purging, those those really if those are present, you really know that probably FBTs should be really considered. Because that kid's unlikely to be able to manage behavioral change with a therapist alone. If they're lower scores, it's pretty encouraging that they could actually do individual work. Um, which is there's more bandwidth to do it, in other words. They're not as lost in the illness. And that's just yeah. important because not everyone has uh, uh, the same the same opportunity or interest or skill base in FBT. So it's a good thing to have alternatives. So if you are running a clinical practice and you didn't have uh, um, you had a limited number of people who could do one or other kind of therapies, you, this would be one way to help sort that. Mm -hmm. and as far as um, uh, doing intensive parental coaching and adaptive care. That's a preliminary finding. We certainly want to replicate that in a larger study. But it does look like that you can um, change trajectories of patients who otherwise would have done badly. Um, they would have had a 80% you know, chance of not doing well to actually getting right back on the same rate of recovery that they would have been on if they had gained weight by session four. That's very encouraging if it, if it holds up um, with further scrutiny. Um, because it would elevate the recovery rates by 20 to 25 percent. So if right now it's it's 45 percent, we would get up there to 60 percent or so, which is really, really, really good. Okay, and we have a couple of questions centering around individual therapists in addition to the core FBT team. So one of our listeners asks, I often get requests for patients to be an individual therapy to supplement FBT. Is this helpful or would this hinder process? And how do you manage parents who are really adamant about bringing on an additional individual therapist? Yeah, so those are really great questions and, real, and, and common dilemmas uh, the therapy space uh, with FBT. Um, the, the main issue um, with having individual therapy isn't um, hasn't got anything to do with um, the therapy per se, in a way. It has to do with how much therapy can a family tolerate um, and actually get to everything they need to get to. So a person with anorexia, for example, you know, they have to go to a medical appointment, individual therapy, and a family therapy appointment, you're putting a pretty high demand 
um, on, on a weekly basis uh, uh, on therapy time. And you'd have to have a pretty clear idea that that's going to have benefit. And, and one of the, a couple of things happen. One is if you have too many treatments, people tend to choose one that they really put their stock in. And there's a tendency uh, for families that insist on individual therapy to view the individual therapy as the key thing. So they diminishes the um, focus and um, uh, uh, urgency around the family work, which we already know that that piece really has to go well early on in treatment in order for things to really get better, or FPT anyway. And, um, the other issue is the philosophy of the individual therapy. If the philosophy is actually runs contrary to FPT, you know, really he's trying to promote self-efficacy and and autonomy, while the parents are trying to manage these behaviors um, under their authority as parents, you've got conflicting theoretical approaches. Um, and that's very confusing for everybody. There are individual therapies that might be compatible. Um, one that we're looking at is cognitive remediation work. Um, we're looking at CRT uh, because we believe that the rigidity and inflexibility uh, and overly detailed focus kind of thinking style of these adolescents who have anorexia um, actually interferes with their ability to use any kind of therapy, individual or family, and might put them at risk over time for relapse. So we want to know whether that kind of individual support might be useful. And we're doing, currently doing a study comparing combinations of FBT and cognitive mediation therapy and FBT and art therapy. Art therapy being a therapy that's expressive, it's uh, it's not a, uh, it's not meant to take on um, any of the uh, theoretical constructs associated with adolescent autonomy and development, but is still um, potentially effective because it could address a kind of emotional um, uh, constriction. So um, wait to see uh, what we find from that study, but if that's one of one kind of uh, approaches to take these other kinds of individual therapies that don't run counter to to uh, FBT while, while still providing some individual support. So that comes to the second half of that question: what to do with parents who insist um, on this? Well, I think you have to you know uh, have to really help them understand why you don't think it's a good idea at the beginning, and that maybe after the first six that weeks of FBT, maybe then you would evaluate whether or not they would need to add it or want to add it. Okay, thank you. We have another question for clinical tips you may have on dealing with families that have high levels of expressed emotion. Mm -hmm. So um, express emotion is a, is a nice way of talking about criticism. Um, and we, we know from a few studies that expressed emotion or family criticism has an impact on outcome in schizophrenia and in, in, in depression. Uh, higher, high, more highly critical families as kids don't do as well. Um, and there's similar um, uh, preliminary data on expressed emotion and family-based treatment um, from studies that were done by Ron Iser and Daniel LaGrange um, in the 90s. Um, so, so the, the, the practical problem partly is knowing what high levels of criticism is. Actually, um, in, in depression and in eating disorders, even a couple of critical comments um, differentiated families uh, that were supposedly high in expressed emotion versus those that weren't. So you have to be pretty subtle in your, your understanding about what that is. Second is that you can block those criticisms by modeling as a therapist a non-blaming and non-critical stance, and also helping parents learn. So when you yelled at her, did you find that she ate better? Um, the answer is almost always no, um, or she did for a little while and then she threw up. Or you know. So that strategy doesn't appear to be working that well. Um, 
And that's consistent, I would say, to the family with what we know about being critical. It doesn't really help people learn. It actually interferes with their learning. It's going to interfere with your ability to be successful. Do you think you can uh, work on that in some way? So I work with them to try and manage it. Okay. And when Daniel and I wrote the manual in 2000, uh, 98, 99, we already knew the results of those studies. So we, in writing that manual, tried to build into the manual uh, things for the therapist to do in the context of FBT that would um, help to mitigate and change family criticism and parental criticism. So, so in the manual, there are already instructions to this effect. Okay, great. And just to um, go back to clarify, I believe with the individual therapist question, you said uh, after about six to eight weeks ish, yeah, you one. can clarify depending upon progress in FBT whether or not individual therapy is warranted at that time or or still desirable at that time. Parents, this is for our parents that insist, right? You, there's actually no data that you will get better outcomes. But if a parent insists on it, I would try and get them to delay it until we had got weight restoration well underway. Okay. And we have a question about age stratified data um, of impact of FPT on outcome. Do you have any thoughts about that, that it, treatment might be more effective for younger patients as opposed to some of our more older adolescents or even young adults? Well, so, yeah, um, of course we, we thought um, in both A and B, and that age might be a moderator. Um, that is, that that younger patients would do better. That would be our hypothesis in FBT than individual therapy, and vice versa. That older patients who um, uh, are uh, more cognitively aware and have more abstract reasoning would be able to use um, different kinds of individual therapies more effectively than 12 or 13 years. Um, what we did find was age was a predictor overall. So younger patients did better, period, in our studies. Now our studies are 12 to 18 year olds for the most part. So younger patients just did better. Um, the average age is about 14 and a little more in our studies. Um, we did not. They did better up across all treatments. All treatments. That's right. Okay. General predictor wasn't a moderator. So we have not found age, age as a moderator. Um, and we actually, you know, we, we, we thought we would because the questions, and you know, based on a good understanding about development, you know, what you'd expect. But um, because the treatment effects in FPT are early and fast and have to do with changing behavior very uh, assertively, it may not matter how old you are, that's just got to happen. Okay. Um, we have another question that's come in about whether or not you've encountered cases when the kiddo, the child or the adolescent, is either not expressing desire to take back control from the parents or is very clearly stating that they do not want this control back because they are fearful it will return to symptom use. Yeah, I have. Um, and most of us who work with these kinds of kids, this is a transition issue to phase two. Um, you know, how do you um, help a, a child who's ambivalent uh, or parents who are ambivalent about transition? Parents are often ambivalent because they finally feel like, oh my gosh, this is under our control now, we can actually manage it. And you know, they don't want to be worried again about you know, giving the control back because that bad things could happen. Um, on the other hand, the, the adolescent who does not want control back that's quite worrying um, for whatever reason. And I have seen that not go well. I think it's a, it's a real um, cautionary flag about where things are uh, in treatment. I've seen um, this be a, a, a strategy to kind of try and wake the parents out and so that anorexia can reemerge on the other side of it. I've seen it, um, and that's a really um, uh, sad outcome. Um, I've seen it, uh, again, because remember, FPT doesn't work for everybody, so I've seen it not work for me. Um, and so uh, that's one of the examples that comes to mind about this uh, boy I treated. To get, as long as his parents made him eat, he would eat. As soon as they tried to transition, 
the food itself. And, and he very, very clearly said, you know, I'm only eating because I don't want to disobey them. And, and I'm not that kind of person. So, um, but I'm not, I'm still anorexic in my head, no matter what weight I am. And so then you have to really work on, on pushing the, the um, uh, aggressively pushing uh, the taking up of, of uh, much like you would with a phobia around, say, flying or, or, or uh, elevators. You have to just do more exposures, more supportive exposures, and we're there in control of them and push the push it. Okay. Really stick with the idea of the phase two goal of transferring that responsibility and and, and getting to yeah, that you, stage. You have to challenge the resistance. Okay. Well, thank you. I believe we are all out of questions, and I really want to sincerely thank you, Jim, for sharing your expertise and your experience with us today. It was wonderful to listen um, to you and, and to hear your answers to all of the questions. Um, and likewise, thank you to the participants who sent some questions in. There was a wide variety. We covered a, a, a breadth of things. So. Um, a recording of the webinar, just so everyone knows, will be available to all members shortly on the AED website. Please watch out for an announcement of the next webinar in this series in early 2016. I urge you all to help spread the word and encourage your colleagues to join AED and to take advantage of the many educational and professional offerings the community has and to join us, of course, at the next ICE, which will be in San Francisco and in May the 5th through the 7th, 2016. Thank you, everybody, very much for your participation today, and have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye.